I want to share with us from the series that we've been doing. And last week we did, um, the, the series is called Interruptions. And the first part, our senior pastor spoke about the story of Mary and Joseph. And today I want to bring to us a story of a couple that God has been working in and through. And we are going to turn to our Bibles in the book of Luke chapter 1, verse 25. Luke chapter 1, verse 25. Sorry, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. We are going to read all the way up to 25. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to 25. And the title of my sermon is Interruption the silent sermon of a remembering God. Interruptions, the silent sermon of a remembering God. And the Bible says in the NIV version, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Verse 11. When an, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. You will find something called the Nazarite vow in the book of Numbers chapter 6, and it explains about this. Verse 16, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how, how can I be sure of, of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well on in years. In years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Verse 21, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was coming, was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among people. 
I want to spend a moment just praying for this word. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the authority of your word. We know that King of kings and Lord of lords, even as we've come to sit at your feet, O God, we know that we will never be the same again. We know, King of glory, that us coming to this place, you have an agenda. You have an agenda with each and every person, O God. We know that there's something that is about to happen in this place, O God, because you say where two or three are gathered, where two or three are gathered, there you are. So, Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Interruptions, the silent sermon of a remembering God. It is interesting that out of the about 40 authors that wrote the Bible, there's one that was not part of the Jewish family. We find that the people that wrote scripture they were part of the Jewish family, apart from one man, and this man is called Luke. Luke is so unique that his inspiration is through research, and he is using a mind of a careful historian and with the heart of a loving physician. Colossians chapter 4, verse 14 speaks of Luke being the great uh, a physician. And Luke being a Gentile, because when you're not a Jew, you were part of the Gentile family. Some people say that Luke was actually um, um, Greek. And then it gets to a moment that Luke, as he is inspired by the Holy Spirit through research, he writes to humanity that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. That is the theme of the book of Luke. And when Luke is speaking to, 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 to the congregation, to, he is addressing it to someone through research, I want us to know that Luke is not like Mark. Mark was addressing it to a Jewish setup. Matthew was addressing it to, to the Jewish people, and that's why Matthew tries to hide, tries to camouflage the weaknesses of the Jewish people, and he was addressing it to the Jewish people under the Roman colony. He is not like John, John the beloved, the beloved one, but Luke is so unique because he's a Gentile, and he is the most biographical when it comes to the story of Jesus Christ. And he is painting a picture in a canvas of the word of God, trying to paint a picture that Jesus Christ is the savior of humanity. He is speaking about good tidings. He is speaking about Jesus Christ filled with compassion. Jesus Christ coming down to humanity, leaving his royal throne so that he will come and spend time with people that were grieving, spend time with people that were hurting, spend time with people that were going through a difficult time. I'm going to teach and then I'll enter into a moment of preaching because I believe the right teaching brings healing. And so it gets to a moment in time we find that there had not been any word from the Lord for 400 years. For 400 years, there was godlessness. For 400 years, God was not speaking. For 400 years, people were lost, and that's why Herod came. A and when you read the book of Luke, the book of Luke, him, he is addressing to a guy called Theophilus, and Theophilus is a title. Theophilus is a title meaning a lover of God, and he is someone that had just given his life to Christ, so Luke was writing it as an instruction to him him as an instruction in the word so that he will grow in the word so that he will grow in salvation you see how important it is when the Lord gets us to a place that we come from this other world and we come into salvation it's important and paramount when we sit at the feet of Jesus so that we will learn so that we will be instructed on how to live in a world that is in need of hope and so 400 years, God had not spoken. In fact, the last prophet that had spoken was actually Micah. And 400 years of silence. And then there's a guy called Herod. Herod was hated by the Jews. He was hated so much by the Jews. And, and, and I don't want to enter into the history of Herod. But we find that there's someone God is still using. There's someone that God chose to use. There's someone who was old and his man, this man's name is Zechariah. 
Zechariah is an old man, and he is serving as a priest, serving in the temple. Something about priests. Their entire life, they were secluded and set apart. They were told, you don't have to acquire any land. You don't have to do anything. But your, your job is just the calling of serving God in the temple alone. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to, 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 to go and look for a job. But you have been placed in the temple alone. Meaning that this man used to serve God his entire life, living the will of God knowing God, teaching the precepts of God. In fact, tradition says that, tradition says that the Jewish people were being taught orally so that when you sit under a teacher, you would ask questions. Tradition was being passed through words of mouth. And this is an old man serving, but the wife is barren, serving God while waiting, serving God, seeing people come to the temple every year while you yourself are waiting. I want to explain something and then we continue to expound this. Priests came from Levi and Aaron was the one who was chosen to serve in the temple. And Aaron had four children. The first one was Nadab. The second one was Abihu. The third one was Eleazar and Ithamar. The first two, that is Nadab and Abihu, died, and they had no sons. The remaining served as priests. King David in the book of First Chronicles chapter 24 separated them into divisions, appointed in terms of um, being, served, be, being, mini, be, being ministering to people in the temple. And then 16 heads of the families from Eliezer's de descendants were used as priests. And then eight from Ithamar's descendants were serving as priests. And these people were impartially divided by casting lots. Each priest served two weeks out of the year in the temple. Each priest served two weeks. And then, from the priests that were serving in the temple, you find that there were some priests that were on duty to see which ministry they would perform. And the Lord fell on Zechariah. And when we are to serve by casting lots, you are the only one who will serve in the most holy place. Another thing about priests is pri a priest will go into God in the most holy place once in a lifetime, once. You will never go again. And whenever you will go into the most holy place, you represent the people. When you go to the people, you represent God. Remember, he's an old man waiting an old man living blamelessly, an old man living a righteous life, an old man, his entire life is known serving God. His entire life, there's nothing. He was consecrated, he was set apart, and he was only in the temple. For his entire life, there's nothing else that he, do, he did apart from serving God. And tell me, what do you do when you've been serving God your entire life? You've been in the presence of God. People have been coming to church, and we are also priests in our homes. You've been serving people. You've been giving them the answers, and, and, and you've been praying for them and encouraging them. But you yourself, you are there, and you're wondering, will, ever, will God ever answer your prayer? I know it's easy to read through the Bible, but it's another thing when you yourself, you're walking through that situation. You are living a life of righteousness. Live alone the life that you are living and you're doing other things. Live alone the life that maybe you are serving God and then at some point you got busy with other things because you can get to a place whereby if God had not answered your prayers, you could say, ah, man, it's because I wasn't serving God at this time. But this man, he served God his entire life. 
but he was barren. The woman was barren. And they were old. He was young and he was old. He became old, struggling to walk. An old man carrying incense, representing the, the prayers of the people, representing the needs of the people in the presence of an almighty God, in the presence of a God who is able to do exceedingly, in the presence of a God who, who does all the things that we, we, we think that man cannot do, but he himself is struggling. Tell me, what do you do when you are at a place whereby your circumstances don't, does, doesn't, don't match your the promise of God. Tell me what do you do when you serve long enough? Tell me what do you do when you've served God and you yourself, you're trusting for a job, when you yourself have been serving God and maybe you are as single as a mango seed and you've been trusting God for a spouse, but you yourself, you're there. And you see people come and attend weddings. You've prophesied to people. You've served people, but you yourself, you're struggling. What do you do when you're the one who is being used of God to speak to other people, but you are there. But I like something that the angel said to Zechariah, and it's in the, in, the, in, the, in the verse, in the book, in the Bible, in the verse 11. And the angel came to him and said, Zechariah, Zechariah saw him, and he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Another thing, I don't know whether there is a place in history in the Bible that says that God appeared through an angel in the most holy place. I don't know, I'm still researching. But this time an angel came and appeared and stood at the right side, meaning the place of authority. And he comes to deliver the word of God and he comes to bring good tidings he comes to speak to him and is coming to tell him that today your prayer has been heard today your prayer has been heard and i've been sent here today to just speak to you you who has been trusting in god and you have been believing in god and you have been serving god all your all, all your life and you have been at a place whereby you're wondering will god ever meet you at your point of need will god ever see you through when it comes to your business will god ever see you through when it comes to relationships and marriage and your children where, 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 do you do you are you at a place whereby you are trusting in God I want to say as a messenger sent by God that God has heard your prayer God has heard your prayer in fact God is saying that good tidings you you are going to he's going to do things that you yourself will wonder you yourself will be amazed because the God that says the God that spoke time immemorial his word is true and his word is final if the angel came and spoke to Zechariah a man that was old a man that had given up a man that was trusting in God but at some moment in time he started doubting God while waiting, I want you to know that God has answered your prayer. And then the message continues and unfolds. There's something so interesting that happens, and it's in verse 18. Verse 18 says, Zechariah now is speaking to the angel. How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well on in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens. You will be silent. Imagine God speaks, gives you instructions, you've been serving God, but then you are at a place that you haven't been taking what God has been saying. I want to teach us something. The word honor in Hebrew means to give weight. The word honor means to give weight, to carry heaviness. The word honor means to respect and to give glory. In other words, when we say that we honor God, whatever he says, 
we carry it with so much weight. We carry it with so much heaviness because it has a magnitude. That's why when God says, I am going to heal you, it doesn't matter if your body is as good as dead, Abraham. God is going to do that. When God says that I am going to promote you, it doesn't matter the people that have been placed there. If they have papers and you yourself don't have papers, you don't have to worry because you have to honor what the word of God says. If you are looking at yourself so weak, God is the one who is calling you. Let let the weak say that I am strong. Let the poor say that I am rich. If you look at yourself as someone who is not going to make it, and if you don't honor God, that is actually where you're going to end up. And Zechariah is at a place that he does not honor God. He's been living his entire life. I spoke about tradition. Could it be that he sat and he learned about Abraham? He learned about how Abraham was without a child until he was at the age of 99. He sat and learned about the miracles of God, the things that God will do that you will not even quantify them. You won't even, if, even argue with them because he separated, he separated the Red Sea. He did many things that even people could not imagine. He sat under that, but he is at a place that he is old, he's trusting God, he's doubting God, and then the Lord shuts his mouth. I don't know why God shut his mouth, but one of the reasons as to why God shut his mouth is because God loved him so much. And the moment that he had been going to God and praying each and every other day, he'd been going to the temple to pray each and every other day, God was taking him to a place that the things that he'd been praying are not cancelled by what he will say after leaving the most holy place. You see, when we speak faith based on the promises of God, when we speak faith, when we speak the word of God, when we speak what God says, it releases faith in us. And faith makes us to actually glorify God. Faith makes us to praise God because God is the one who says things. And when he says he will do it, whatever God says, he is actually, it is actually coming to pass because he is God. No one voted him in. No one will vote him out. He is God. He is omnipotent. Important. He is omnipresent. There is the God that is always there. He is Jehovah Shammah. He understands. He knows all prayers. And God is never early nor, nor late. But God is always on time. And the reason as to why he was shut is because he would have cancelled. And God has given us this mouth so that we will speak the oracles of God, so that we will speak faith, so that when we honor God, whatever God says, we take it and we honor it. And the book of Proverbs chapter 18 verse 21 says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. In other words, the word power in Hebrew means yad, and yad is hand when it's transliterated, meaning that I can say that life and death is in the hand of the tongue. So Whatever you say, whatever you say when you honor God, it's like a hand comes out and forms with that which you're saying. And I'm not speaking about creating, but I'm speaking about what the scripture says. So when you are seated there and you are wondering and you are not honoring God and you are at a place that you are not speaking life, because if you're not speaking life, you are speaking death. And I want to give us a moment right now. I want you for 30 seconds to start speaking life over your marriage, to start speaking life over your situation, to start speaking life over your barrenness, to start speaking life over your family, over your business, over your job situation. Start speaking life right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we are speaking life right now. We are speaking life right now in the name of Jesus. Start speaking life over which sit that situation that you think God is not able to do it. Start speaking life right now. Father, we are speaking life right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we are speaking life right now in the name of Jesus because you gave us this mouth to speak your oracles to speak life because Jesus is the author of life and father we are speaking life because if you're not speaking life you are speaking death and God will actually shut your mouth some of us have been beating up ourselves we've been beating up ourselves by words we've been beating up ourselves because we don't honor God. 
if you're not speaking life, you are speaking death. Are you speaking death over your family? Are you speaking death over your situation? Are you speaking death over that which you think is impossible because God is the one who steps in? In fact, God is checking on your faith. He's not checking on your bank account. God is asking you, are you speaking life because he's given you the word and you use the word because you honor him. And if you don't honor him, we will keep on coming to church. We will keep on praying, but then when we leave the place of prayer, we dishonor God, meaning to revile, and we start speaking death. And I remember when I joined Bible school in 2011, my parents had died. My sisters were nowhere to be seen. And I remember I, I entered fa fa first year. And when I entered first year, I was at a time that I didn't have money. When I went for the interview, I actually told the people that, have, that were interviewing me that it is the one that brought me here that will pay my fees. And then I continued to study until first semester ended. Second semester came and I remember being sent home because of fees, because of 120,000. Where will that money came? But I remember understanding the scripture, taking it as it is. I remember sitting somewhere and looking at myself in the mirror and I started speaking life. I started speaking life and I started saying, God, I know that you are going to provide for me. God, I know that you are my provider. God, I know that I've gone through pain. I've gone through a season of lacking. I've gone through a season of barrenness. But God, I am speaking life. I know that you are my sponsor. I know that you did not bring me to this place so that other people will look at me in shame. But I know that God, you are, you are who you are. You are my provider. You are my healer. You are the lifter of my head. And I remember while I was speaking life, someone all the way from Jeddah in Asia sent me money, 120 thousand and I started seeing that the reality of the scripture is working and I continue saying God, I know that next semester I will not struggle. I know that, God, you will provide for me. I know that, God, you will give me a place to stay. And shortly, someone called me and told me that we've been thinking about you and we are going to give you a place to stay. You don't have to pay rent. You don't have to pay anything until you graduate. And the person back in Jeddah told me that I will be paying your fees every semester. In fact, he used to throw me some money as friends benefit because you are speaking life. Appreciate God in this place. If you're not speaking life, you are speaking death. If you're not speaking life, you are speaking death. And God will shut you, the silent someone, over remembering God. And I remember still when I was in Bible school, I used to struggle so much. I never went to the dining hall. I would only go when it was sports day because food was free. But I remember one day I was seated in class while other people had gone for lunch. And while I was, I was in that desk, I was crying and I was telling God, even though in my tears I know that you are the one who take away my sorrows. I know that God, you are the one who is able to turn tables. And while I was crying, and speaking life, there was a woman that was tapping, that was knocking at the, uh, at the door of my desk. And she said, I am fasting for 40 days and I am going to give you this rice and beef for the entire time that you are in this school. You see how it happens when we speak life because if you're not speaking life and God has given you a mouth to speak, God understands all languages, he understands all dialects. If you're not speaking life, you are speaking death and that's why God will shut you. The silent summons of God. Are you speaking life or are you speaking death? Doubt releases silence, but faith releases praise. If you're not speaking life, you are speaking death over your situation, over your marriage, over your business, over your family, over that proposal, over that venture, over that relationship over whichever thing that God has placed in your life. Are you speaking 
life or God will shut you because you're canceling the things that he is saying. The silent sermon of a remembering God. And it was so interesting that people were waiting outside when God was dealing with Zachariah inside. God was dealing with Zachariah inside. But the people, when they saw Zachariah, they thought that this man has had a revelation, but God was working. He could not speak. Whenever you didn't have children in the Jewish culture, it was considered a disgrace. And then he went home. And even as I come to the end, I want to say this. The name Zechariah means the Lord has remembered. The name Elizabeth means the God of oath. The name John, the child that was born, means the Lord has been gracious. In other words, both names cast the mind back to the covenant God made with their forefathers, a covenant he is bound to remember on oath. God's remembrance is not passive recollection like a human being. It's not passive recollection of thoughts, but an active performance. God has always been at work. God has always been in the business of working things out for your good. To join all three names, the Lord's grace and favor will always swiftly follow his remembering. I repeat this again. The Lord's grace and favor will always swiftly follow his remembering. The Lord has remembered. He has remembered his oath or promises. He has remembered to be gracious to you in this season. As I finish, John was born as a priest. He was supposed to live a Nazarite vow, not to be in touch with a um, fermented drink, not to touch a dead body. He was separated. John represents that which God has gifted us with. Are you using it for God? John was born as a priest, but he served as a prophet, paving way for the coming Messiah. I want you to know that the thing that God has blessed you with, the moment you use it, you will see the wonders that he will do with it. You will see, like we read, it will turn the hearts of many to God. It will turn fathers to their children. It will do wonders. And lastly, what are you praying for in this season? Is there anything that you are reminding God about? Remember, not passive collection, recollection of thoughts, but active performance. Is there anything you are remembering God about? His favor is upon you. He will bring rejoicing in your home because the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. If he did it for a man so old, he's still faithful. I want us to bow down our heads. And I'm speaking to you today, even as our heads are bowed, the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. It doesn't matter how many times you failed. It doesn't matter how many times you flopped. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful to perform that which he said in his promises. The Lord is faithful to you, my brother. The Lord is faithful to you, my sister. The Lord is faithful because he says he is faithful. 
We honor him because we know that he is faithful. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your faithfulness. Just open your mouth and start speaking to him. He is a faithful God. He is a faithful God. He is the God who is here. He is the God who understands your pain. He understands the challenges that you've gone through. He is faithful. He is faithful today. He is faithful in this season. He is the God of seasons. Father, you are faithful over your people. You are faithful, O King of glory. Father, there is nothing that is impossible with you, O God. Lord, the one who defies the laws of gravity and the, Lord of the, the laws of distribution, you are faithful this day. You are faithful this day. You are faithful this day. We are glad that we came to this house of the Lord because God we know there is barrenness no more. We are glad that we came into this house, oh God, because we know joblessness no more, oh God. We are faithful that we came into your house, oh God, because King of glory you are fulfilling, you are fulfilling the truth of your word, the truth of your word. You are faithful Lord. You are faithful Jesus. You are faithful over our lives. You are faithful over our finances. You are faithful over our businesses. You are faithful, O King of glory, over our marriages. You are faithful, O King of glory. Even when we've lost faith, you are faithful, O King of glory. You are faithful, O God. The Lord that remembers. The Lord that remembers. The Lord that remembers. You've seen the tears. You've seen the doubts, O God. You've seen the questions, O King of glory. And Father, today you are telling us that you are faithful. In the name of Jesus, you are faithful, O oh God. Faithful you are. Faithful you are. Faithful you are, King of glory. Faithful you are. And we continue to speak life over the God that remembers. You are faithful, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. You're here and you're saying you want to give your life to this Jesus Christ. The one that is faithful. The one that says, come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Just raise your hand, and we are going to pray with you. Just lift up your hand so that I can see, and we are going to pray with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that hand. Just lift up your hand so that the ashes will come and pray with you. Thank you, King of glory. Thank you for that other hand. Thank you, Lord of lords. You are saying you're giving your life to Jesus. This is the best decision that you can ever make. Just lift up your hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just lift it high so that I can see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, King of glory. This is the greatest miracle that can ever happen to humanity. When people are coming to his kingdom, thank you, Lord of lords. Thank you, King of kings. Thank you, mighty and everlasting Father, for you are faithful. You are faithful, O oh God. You are faithful. Just repeat this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. The old has gone and the new has come. So thank you for accepting me into your family. Today I am a new creature. So have your way in my heart, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's appreciate God. Let's appreciate God for that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.